I would like to introduce Larry O'Donnell, who is going to do our, presenta our presentation tonight um, from glaciers to gentrification. And I like to think that what we're doing here is kind of a bridge to some of that, maybe not quite glaciers and certainly not gentrification if you just look around. Um, but we're trying, and we've decided twinkle lights hide a world of hurt. Um, Larry has been a water professional for about 20 years. He and I met at Lakeside Nature Center 20 some five years ago, started working on birds of prey and then both realized that we liked the water stuff. I liked the clean up the action, the that stuff. Larry liked the education and the people and the kids and that stuff. And uh, we both really liked the restoration. So. Um, I'm lucky to have had a 20-year business partner that is uh, a great guy and a pain in the neck. Um, but he uh, gives a pretty good presentation. The other thing that you'll note about Larry is that he has a secret, uh, real enjoyment of these old photographs. And I can't tell you how many hours, how many hours, when Larry says something like, oh, Vicki, look at this. I just got this disc from Sean. <laughs> or, oh, look at this, I just found this link. Or, oh, look at this postcard. Uh, so, Larry knows a lot more than he likes to say about this stuff. So, with that, I will give you Glaciers to Gentrification and Larry O'Donnell. <clears throat> I'm not sure how to respond to all that. Uh, <laughs> I did have to tell myself no more pictures, stop looking, because <laughs> I'd still be doing that. Uh, and I d we did get a lot of them from Sean and uh, off the internet, and uh, I am by no means a history expert, that's why there are no questions. <laughs> but uh, So th there's, uh, there's lots of history uh, with the West Bottoms. and. Uh, Healthy Rivers Partnership here, uh, we uh, connect people to their rivers, and so this uh, history is part of that connecting. And as Vicki said before, we are at the River Center, and uh, Healthy Rivers Partnership and Little Blue River Watershed Coalition. So welcome to the River Center, and a short history of the West Bottoms. Starting with, way back, pre-glacial, Missouri River wasn't even here. The Kansas River came out of western Kansas and went across Missouri, actually entered the Missouri River about, around Jefferson City. The Missouri River cut an angle across the northeast part of the state. Turkey Creek, which is an integral part of the West Bottoms, uh, originally went, this, there was actually a valley here along the call all the way over to the, where the Blue River is now. The Blue River enters the Missouri River here at uh, basically at 435. So Turkey Creek used to go all the way over there and uh, the Caw uh, it, it entered into the Caw there when the, where the Blue entered into the Caw. There was no Missouri River. After the glaciers, the glacier came down and reached the northern edge of the Missouri River. And that's why we have this very unusual right angle turn for a river instead of the S's. That's why the river is, is the way it is here in Kansas City, because it was the meltwater from the glaciers. So that glacier came down to this edge here. Blue River by that time was still going that way, but uh, Turkey Creek has now entered into the Caw River. So the glaciers came down all the way to right here and looky there, there's the right angle turn. So it was meltwater. It pushed the Missouri River all the way down to Kansas City now and made it what it is today. So early on, 1840, Turkey Creek actually ran, this is the Missouri River. This is the West Bottoms Bluff, Turkey Creek ran across the bluff. You are here, all right? So we are right next to where Turkey Creek used to be. 
This uh, last building down here, they tried to put an addition on uh, many years ago, and they kept finding so many Indian artifacts that they just finally gave up. They didn't want to dig there anymore because this was all along the shores of Turkey Creek. So there are a lot of uh, a lot of natives around here. And this map is uh, actually uh, Westport Landing and a uh, parish map. So uh, like Shoto's all the way down here, and that would be down by uh, uh, Shoto Bridge. And then uh, settlers all along here, up into town. This is the uh, Catholic uh, uh, cathedral up there, and uh, the bottoms. So, totally different back in 1840. At one time, it, Turkey Creek entered its water into the Missouri, and uh, that was uh, like we saw there in uh, 1840. Um, was the, the 1823 showed that, the 1840 map showed that, and uh, there were basically two streams uh, that separated Kansas and Missouri. The flood of 1844, the flood of record. We know about the 51 flood and, and we know about the 1903 flood, but the big flood, the biggest flood ever, was the flood of 1804. And that moved Turkey Creek over to the Kansas River. And that's where it stayed until uh, we'll see later uh, what they did to Turkey Creek. But so back then, 1840, 1844, uh, we're just, the town's just starting. This is actually Main Street uh, looking south at 18, 1867. Uh, you can see it's all uh, pretty much Wild West. Here's the bottoms. This is a picture of the West Bottoms you most people have never seen. This is the Kansas River over here. And here's, this is taken uh, basically from uh, the bluff, uh, Quality Hill, looking down into the bottoms. You can see housing and uh, there's a, a church over there, there's a schoolhouse. So it was uh, growing at the sa basically uh, the same rate as uh, the River Market area. 1895, they just exploded. So this is uh, what basically where we were looking at before was right here. And now we've got the railroad, these huge railroad yards. Stockyards, all these squares here, these are all stockyards. And Kansas City was becoming a huge cattle town. By 1900, we've got trolley cars down in, in the bottoms, and uh, it's a full-blown city down there. 1903, it rained. So this is just the beginning of the flood. Uh, you can see uh, some of that uh, the railroad cars there. I'm not quite... Well, let's see, those railroad cars there, and that looks like a Union Depot, which after I've seen all these pictures, I'm beginning to recognize the old Union Depot. This was the extent of the 1903 flood. There's the stockyards. We're right over here, but this entire area. So basically bluff to bluff, and uh, on the Missouri too. This is the East Bottoms over here, and this is uh, where the downtown airport was uh, to be, but at the time it was uh, still able to take a lot of flood water. This is the East Bottoms, uh, just to give you an idea of how much water they got at the same time too. That's the, the uh, CNA Freight Depot, and there it is after the flood, but back to our side of the, of the uh, bluffs, the uh, Blossom House uh, in uh, early 1900, uh, which is uh, the preeminent hotel, and that's actually right across the street from Union Depot. This is the 1903 flood. These, uh, these folks here are standing on a deck on the depot looking across the street at all of that water. 
Union Depot postcard that was before, from the before time. And a picture of what it, what it was like, that's on the uh, train track side. Uh, quite the edifice. Um, I've heard things about it, but I, I didn't really uh, verify any of that this time. But it was, you know, one of the largest construction projects of its kind at, the, at that time. You know, you're talking uh, 1900s. And lots of water. This is, uh, for some reason, Union Depot and Blossom House were very popular with uh, the flooded picture crowd. <laughs> so, so we got lots of those. This is the inside of, of uh, the depot, full of water in uh, 1903. These uh, floods are almost all of them happened in June, uh, which is, of course, typical of our spring rains. This is one I hadn't seen before uh, of Union Depot. There's the depot flooded out. These, uh, it's a little bit more shallow here. They're, these trains are still on the tracks. But this is up on the bluff. And the West Bluffs were full of these basically shanties, these poor shack houses down here too. And so that gives you a good idea of what the bluffs look like. Union Depot, the Missouri River, the Kansas River, West Bottoms. The 1903 flood actually uh, originated in Kansas and came down the Kansas River. And this is one of the uh, bridges that was there at the time, the uh, elevated uh, railroad uh, at this electric powerhouse. This is the Kansas River. This is, I'm not quite sure, I think it's under uh, the 9th Street incline, but uh, a fellow there in his uh, canoe in the 1903 flood. Same thing uh, going on in uh, Kansas City, Kansas at the same time. People in their little boats with, their, with uh, the flood waters. And you can see by this, it's not very high. Uh, actually, in the West Bottom, so it was considerably higher. Santa Fe Street. This is two blocks south of the Missouri River and a, uh, a huge sinkhole uh, that had developed after the flood. More destruction. Just uh, tons and tons of water. Uh, it came up quick uh, and just did untold uh, amount of damage. Uh, like knocking over all kinds of train cars and uh, destroying railroad tracks and bridges. There were 16 bridges on the Kansas River that got carried away in two hours time. Now that had got to be something to see. I mean, uh, <laughs> that's a whole lot of water. They talk about how fast this water came up and, and how hard it was to get, uh, to get away from it. Um, out of all those bridges, uh, only one of them survived. Uh, the railroad bridges, they put the trains out on them to, try, to make them heavier. And the only one that survived was the, the, this one, the double track structure. And you can see there's the train, two trains actually on it. And that weight was the only thing that kept that bridge, bridge there. And that was the only one that survived. The flow line bridge, Kansas City was getting its drinking water uh, from... Uh, Quindaro from the other side of uh, the river, and there was a uh, elevated um, water line that was on the flow line bridge, which is part of this of uh, the flow right line bridge is still there. This part of it got washed away. This is uh, the flow line bridge repaired, where they uh, instead of building a whole other section like there was before, they, they uh, suspended that pipeline. Uh, along there. But so 1903, 10 million dollars worth of damages. And because of that flow line bridge and that water line, the city was out of that water for 12 days. So that was kind of an issue for him. And then uh, because there wasn't any water, it also shut down uh, gas and electric. They decided to put it underground. They weren't going to put, put a water line over that river again. It was too unpredictable. 
And so this is the, uh, the north shaft. Uh, so the flood was 1903, this is 1911, um, where they, uh, they went down and uh, dug a tunnel underneath the river. Uh, this is it uh, actually, uh, what, 15 years later or something. Um, and it's flooding again. The Kansas River, the tracks here are almost flooded, but it's uh, uh, just another uh, example of why the river is so unpredictable. So they dug that flow line bridge by hand. Uh, these guys here, uh, rail there, uh, burrows, donkeys with the carts, pulling that rock out and making that, uh, they dug down through all the less and down into the bedrock and uh, built that, put that water line underneath so that they wouldn't have those flooding issues with it again. And this is around the same time too and they're trying to put back all those bridges and stuff and so this is just a picture of uh, one of the rock barges uh, that they were using to move rock up and down that section of the Kansas River. Some of those bridges they never put back, a couple of them they combined, uh, a lot of them were only a single track uh, and basically connecting to the yards across the river. That was 1903. 1908 was another flood and this one's not even really a flood of record. Uh, you just when you're looking at 1903 you end up with a bunch of 1908 pictures too. <laughs> so uh, and you can see uh, it's uh, Wagons and uh, 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 probably a few motorized vehicles, but uh, mostly industrial down down here in the bottoms. Um, this is uh, Wyoming Street, looking northeast. So uh, that would be uh, the bluffs over there. More of 1908, uh, and this is giving you a good idea of what was down here. Uh, lots of industry, but lots of um, wholesale warehouses, the Biscuit Company, uh, Royal Beer, which I'm not quite sure where it is, but any, any play, time you can get wholesale beer, you can't go wrong with that. And here we are, 1908 again, and this is uh, West 11th Street from Hickory, so this is like down uh, by the uh, uh, First Friday stuff, by the, where the vintage stores are starting on this side. And you can see once again, it was all horse and wagon. But uh, a lot of development. The bottoms, because of this bluff over here, it's kind of hard to get down into here, especially when you're coming from Kansas City or downtown Kansas City or what moved up uh, to uh, Quality Hill, which is the top of the hill up there. So this is a uh, stereo opticon, which is uh, one of those little glasses that you look through and, you, and it shows you it, one, those two combined into one picture. But this is the 9th Street incline uh, looking up towards the hill in the 1880s. Uh, there is the uh, device, the, uh, the uh, cable car going up it. But the 9th Street incline was so steep, the uh, inaugural uh, um, ride on it with all the dignitaries, they got right to the edge and it started to go down and Everybody got so scared that it was going to turn over, they all jumped off, and the only one, only, only one left was the conductor. <laughs> so this thing didn't last very long because it dropped so far, almost 20 feet every, every 100 feet, and you can see how, how steep it is, and that caused all kinds of issues with it, uh, mainly with the cable and the weight and uh, the cost of uh, maintaining the thing. So it was a wonderful deal, but the 9th Street incline didn't last very long. You can see here in this picture uh, the Union Depot down there and Blossom House is behind it. 
So, same thing here uh, with Union Depot, but this, this also shows you, uh, there's the 9th Street incline. This is the 8th Street tunnel, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. It's actually going into the ground there. This, uh, I don't know the name of this street, but this is the main road that was, came down into the bottoms from uh, the river market. And uh, over here is the beginnings of what would eventually turn into the uh, inner city viaduct, 1907. So from Kansas City, Kansas to Kansas City, Missouri, elevated roadway over the West Bottoms, 1907. Don't have to worry about any flood. You can go from one town to the other, no matter what the river's doing underneath you. And this is, when is this? They haven't built the highways yet. It's probably the 1940s. Uh, you can see the main road coming down here. You can see where the railroad comes in and the tracks go through here. This is the A Street Tunnel going right into the side of the bluff there. There's another picture of it as it goes into the tunnel. There's the top of Quality Hill. This was an amazing deal too. It did not last either. This is part of the tunnel uh, that they actually rediscovered here about, uh, oh, I don't know, it was five or ten years ago. Um, DST uh, the Realty Company found part of it, and uh, what it's looking like now is, well, this is just an aerial view of where it is and where it's going into the hill there, uh, which also, by the way, is 12th Street coming up out of the bottoms. No more 9th Street incline, just the 8th Street tunnel. There's the 12th Street incline, which before they had a bridge, Everything was an incline. Uh, I don't know why they weren't bridges, but they were inclines. And uh, they, uh, this was trolley, uh, trolley tracks, and there's the roundhouse that uh, they used to turn them around at. This is the 12th Street Bridge uh, being built in 1914, the incline being turned into the 12th Street Bridge. So the trolleys were off of it. Uh, and. If you're familiar with the area, uh, it's basically a, a two-story bridge that goes to two separate parts of the bottoms, one farther on. Also around the same time, this is back at Kansas City waterfront, but I had to show this photo. You don't get to see this kind of stuff too often. But uh, they had uh, begun channelizing the river and uh, because it was so wide, uh, it was shallow, uh, they lost lots of steamboats in the late 1800s. They would uh, basically run into tree snags. It's a sandy bottom. The trees would get stuck in the bottom. Boat would run into them, get a big hole in it. It would sink. It might only go down four or five feet, but the boat was considered lost. Uh, quite often they were able to retain their merchandise and passengers could walk to shore. But that was quite an issue, and so they uh, started engineering the river and uh, cutting off some of the bends and uh, making more of a permanent channel to it. And by the time they got that done, uh, instead of uh, people and mercantile uh, goods, we were mostly transporting large barge equipment. Part of that, uh, uh, the barge traffic taking over and the people and the uh, uh, smaller goods not being moved was new technology. Uh, new technology in particular being the railroad and the Hannibal Bridge, which was the first railroad bridge across the Missouri River. The Hannibal Bridge is right next to the uh, Broadway Bridge out here. The Hannibal Bridge was originally built in uh, 1869. Uh, and I'm not sure which version we're looking at here. I think this is most, most of this is uh, the uh, 1869 bridge. Uh, so uh, they built the piers out there in the middle. You can see the structure here, steamboats out there. Uh, here's from the south bank looking over to the north bank. 
they're getting a lot of it done. This is uh, looking to also back to the North Bank. More of these Hannibal Bridge pictures uh, showing you the, the pillars that they're building on shore. The bridge is a little bit different uh, than it was than it is today in that this fencing structure is not down here anymore. Now this piece up here pivots on this pier and that is still here and uh, um, operates. But uh, actually this um, Well, I, first here, uh, also along the top of it was a uh, roadway. And so when trains were using it, that was how uh, wagons and people got across the river. And so this is uh, looking south, and this is Gillis House here underneath uh, on the bluff. And this is the bridge after it's been completed. This is the original bridge. The, uh, where is that picture? I thought it got hit by a tornado in, uh, I think it was 1903, and so they had to rebuild it. Uh, so this bridge out here, I think it's 100 years old, the Hannibal Bridge. The highway bridge next to it is 50 years old. Which one's being rebuilt? This is the dedication of the Hannibal Bridge, the original Hannibal Bridge, uh, in 1869, and you can see uh, it was quite popular and a lot of people came out to uh, see that bridge. That bridge and that railroad connected uh, Kansas City. There's the uh, section that got taken out by the, by the tornado. And here it is uh, coming off the bridge and you come down into the bottoms. But this, uh, and that's the traffic part of it, and the railroad went underneath it and the cars were on the top of it, so it was a, basically a double-decker bridge. But that bridge connected the uh, stockyards in uh, Kansas City to uh, the meat packers in uh, Chicago and uh, uh, basically made Kansas City the uh, what it is today. This is uh, still part of the old bridge uh, with this fencing structure underneath, but uh, this thing still pivots and uh, rests on a pier, opens up for these, uh, for the uh, steamboats to go through. We have other bridges out there, uh, but this Hannibal Bridge was really the bridge that made Kansas City, and it was because of that railroad connection. St. Joe was trying to get it at the same time, and if they had gotten the bridge first, they would have been the major city in, on the uh, Missouri River here. Uh, this is a picture uh, looking north uh, uh, from Harlem to uh, downtown Kansas City. There, along the top there is where the cars go and along the bottom here is where the uh, trains go. Even with all that, uh, we were still quite dedicated to the river uh, because Kansas City is here because of the river. Uh, it was, the, you know, the original major highways and because of the confluence of the uh, Kansas and Missouri. This is actually the opening of what is now the port of Kansas City, uh, where we still have barges coming in. Um, I don't know, I'm not sure how many a month, at least a dozen a month, 
Uh, I think we're getting more and more of those all the time, but they're also they're carrying uh, large, uh, bulky items. This is uh, just down the street here, actually, uh, pretty much at State Line Road. This is the inner city viaduct, and uh, the pier is over here. Here's another uh, Hannibal Bridge in 1940, but this is also the proposed Woodsweather Bridge, which is so no Broadway bridge yet, but the Woodsweather Bridge went across the railroad tracks and down into the West Bottoms, and uh, you are here. Broadway Bridge. They uh, took the uh, top passenger track off of the Hannibal Bridge and built the Broadway Bridge. A uh, section at a time, 1956. And this is what it is today, the Hannibal Bridge and the Broadway Bridge. The Broadway Bridge, tall enough so that uh, barges can get under it, and there's the pivoting structure that the Hannibal Bridge rests on. Still operates today, and any time a barge goes by, uh, they have uh, microwave uh, telecommunications now. But so by 1914, with the, that bridge and the stockyards booming, uh, the stockyards had come to uh, what? Covered over 200 acres, uh, 170,000 animals a day, employed 20,000 people, and uh, got stock from 35 different states. Uh, originally, they started, they were running uh, cattle right to town here, to the stockyards. Uh, what was it that happened? A, uh, a Texas drive uh, drove cattle to uh, Sedalia and uh, uh, introduced the disease into the cattle, which basically brought on a quarantine. So at one time, <clears throat> they weren't coming into the bottoms anymore. They were being quarantined across the uh, uh, river, the Kansas River over in uh, Kansas City, Kansas. And then they moved out even farther. And with the railroads, that was easier to do. So then they were coming into places like Dodge City and uh, uh, areas farther west. Uh, the cattle could be transported by train. And by that time, too, uh, we'd come to uh, the meat packing industry was starting to bloom here in Kansas City. The uh, Livestock Exchange Building, uh, which is uh, kind of the iconic building of the, of the stockyards today and, and what we, basically all that's left of the stockyards today, it was built in 1911. The stockyards covered a lot of area, a lot of cattle, pens like this, pens like this, Floods like this with livestock marooned on the dike. So, and then the Kansas City, the uh, Livestock Exchange Building. And this building was built in 1911. It's uh, experienced a renaissance. Uh, Bill Haw, uh, uh, I can't remember his company, but he owns a ranch, Haw Ranches. Uh, what else? Haw Contemporary, I think, is his son. Basically, uh, bought this building and started redoing it. And uh, this is our connection with uh, the historic West Bottoms. And at this point now, I believe uh, very close to that is going to be some uh, housing starting. The stockyards, not only the floods, uh, but also uh, 1917, there was a huge fire. Uh, only over a million and a half dollars paid out. Uh, 17,000 cattle and hogs killed. And then, <laughs> so that they didn't die, 30,000 of them had to be <laughs> turned out into the street and then picked up later. So that was quite a feat in itself. And so the meat packers came in. And we didn't have any environmental regulations. And so, and at that time, everybody believed that you put it in the river and it goes away. Later, we found that that's not really quite the case and it always goes somewhere. Uh, but uh, so all the refuse from all of these plants was going right into, basically into the Kansas River. Most of it was going into the Kansas River. 
and then the odor, the odor down here. I mean, if you've been down here very often, you know there's a sewer plant down at the end of the road and sometimes that can get smelly. But imagine 200 acres of feedlot down here. If you ever drive by any of these uh, larger feedlots out in the countryside, uh, you understand what the, what the odor situation is. So uh, the factory, uh, the, uh, the air, the water quality, all of that combined, uh, and basically uh, that's when Kansas Cityans started turning their back on the river because the river was, just then it was a disposal ditch. Nobody wanted to be in it. There are stories, uh, Danny O'Neill in his uh, book about the Irish up from the bottoms talks about in the early 1900s, I believe it was 1910, it was a, a depression here in town and uh, there were a lot of poor folks living in the bottoms and along the West Bluff. They would go out into that Kansas River, they'd actually tie ropes around their kids and send them wading out there uh, into the blood and offal to uh, retrieve the livers because the stockyards were throwing them away and they needed food. So you can imagine a situation like that. Uh, doesn't really make you want to get on the river. Turkey Creek, which we talked about a little bit earlier, uh, ran through the bottoms. Uh, so it was along the bluff in 1844. It got pushed to the Kansas River uh, after that flood. This is uh, part of the original uh, alignment of it. But you can see here, we've got the Kansas River. The Missouri River is up here. Turkey Creek used to go along here and dump into the uh, Missouri River. So they built this diversion tunnel. So it was running all the way through the bottoms here. And that, of course, caused all kinds of flooding issues, uh, basically constantly. Now, it was great ditch for putting uh, all your waste in, but uh, it flooded. It flooded constantly. And so they cut this whole section off and made this diversion tunnel and ran it straight to the uh, Kansas River there. And so all of this that used to flood this area out down here is now gone. Uh, where OK Creek is. Uh, I'm not sure where it comes in. But OK Creek, uh, with all this flooding, they moved the depot. And they moved it up to where it is now, up on Pershing. On top of a stream. <laughs> I mean, there's building in the floodplain, but they built that on a stream. And so in order to handle that, they put it in a pipe. So OK Creek is our only completely in a pipe stream that you don't see the beginning or the end. And it goes into Turkey Creek and it runs through town. But that was part of the miracle of our engineering. And uh, those are things that we figured out uh, due to those unintended consequences and all that flooding that we had. You know, how we changed the landscape to start with and then uh, uh, what are we gonna do with all that water? What are we gonna do with all that water? 1951 flood. Now, uh, 1844 was bigger. Um, 1903, I, I think, was actually uh, uh, higher in discharge. But the 51 flood, this is <laughs> what we have here. This is the entire bottoms. So you've got the Kansas River here. You've got your inner city viaduct. We're over here somewhere right now. There's the, the bluff. Here's 12th Street. The entire the stockyards are over here. Uh, I think this is Central Avenue coming down into it. But... I think it was uh, 14 feet 
over a flood stage at the confluence of the Kansas and Missouri. It did lots and lots of damage. Uh, way more than, than any of the others because of all this uh, development we had in here. Killed all the cattle, destroyed everything everywhere. I mean, this, these are, you can imagine those, uh, all of that water. Faultless spray starch, their headquarters are down here uh, a block away. They got a five story building. There's uh, uh, on the first floor the high water mark. They're, I don't know, it's, well, it's probably about 14 feet, but it's, uh, it is high. And all of this stuff down here, this building right here would have been almost to the ceiling there in, in the center part. A Street. And you can see uh, where the water's been flowing and uh, train pu pushed up against the, the uh, bridge there. Still water everywhere. Looking west, uh, basically from Quality Hill down into the bottoms. And so we've got the Kansas River here and the Missouri River over here. Uh, this, uh, this is the uh, 12th Street Bridge. Kansas River. Didn't take out all those bridges again. Those ones that have been rebuilt, but uh, it certainly overtopped a bunch of them. Uh, this railroad bridge being one of them. Here's the uh, 1951 from Terrace Park, which is up on the hill. So here's the Missouri River, the Kansas River over here. The West Bluffs were all shanty towns, and uh, there were ladders up and down them, but uh, you can see this is, this is what was on the West Bluffs as compared to uh, the Keeley Institute up on top of, on Quality Hill here, and uh, some of these, uh, ha this housing over here. So these are the people on the hill, and these are the ones down in the valley doing all the all the labor and so you had things like these guys here it's hard to see there's a family of three there and uh, more of the, of the bluff here both of these are before the uh, the road uh, Jersey Coats Road uh, which is not there anymore uh, got put in this is Jersey Coats Road but this is West Terrace Park from up on Quality Hill uh, you can still see some of this up here, and the stairwell down here is kind of iconic. There was a fountain there. So much so that recently, this guy uh, decided, and they've, there's more housing up here too. And so that's part of all of this, more interest in this area, but more housing up on Quality Hill. But uh, so there are a bunch of people up there uh, Friends of West Terrace Park now that uh, basically discovered this stuff and decided to uh, reclaim it. And so uh, they dug this thing out uh, under the mud and uh, the honeysuckle. And uh, you can go up that staircase now. That 51 flood, though, it pretty much wiped out the bottoms. Uh, it killed all the, uh, the cattle. Uh, the meatpacking industry suffered horrendously because uh, you had warehouses full of stuff like this. And this is all meat that's been, uh, you know, in, in the river water. Uh, there's something like 230,000 railroad cars full of meat that they, that uh, some of it, I guess, passed inspection, but a lot of it had to be destroyed. And so that, <laughs> that's a big loss. Uh, uh, billion dollars uh, basically in uh, 51 uh, money was the uh, was the results of that flood and so they put a flood wall up but when you've got that kind of loss you're looking at going somewhere where the water's not quite as high and you're not threatened and so they they moved out farther and then they didn't need to be by the railroad anymore because of trucks and so uh, the whole stockyards, the whole bringing all the cattle into one spot, 
slaughtering them and then moving out. That whole system has changed and is spread around now. Feedlots, they don't bring them into town. They're out, out farther in the countryside. Uh, they run their uh, cattle uh, and uh, pigs and lambs all through that and uh, use the railroad and trucks. But basically the meatpacking industry never came back. The stockyards never came back. It was sort of the end. I don't know where this picture came from, but it was in my, all the flood ones, so I, I could not resist it. But basically the 1951 flood, the cows left. And so that was the, uh, the end of uh, the uh, meatpacking industry in the stockyards down here. And this area sat for a long, long time. Uh, basically turned into a pretty derelict area. And it started coming back with the haunted houses. And four of them now, uh, all owned by Full Moon Productions. So the haunted houses came back, but we haven't seen any ghost cows yet. Although I'm pretty sure they're out there. How could they not be? If you've got haunted houses. <laughs> and so, uh, Right now, uh, the Bottoms is uh, being revitalized. Uh, we've got restaurants going in, new galleries. Uh, the, this thing calls them antique shops. I should have changed that. They're not antique shops, they are vintage stores because we can charge more for vintage stores. And there's still that stuff that you grew up with that you don't really consider an antique, but you know, oh look, it's the old Hattie Duty doll. And so they're open uh, first weekends of every month. Some of them now are uh, open every weekend. And, but uh, these buildings that sat empty for years, there's lofts now, there's uh, event lots of event spaces, artist studios, galleries, and uh, residential development on the horizon. Uh, at this point, there weren't any uh, authorized residential units down here. Although uh, you can have a, one living space in a warehouse, a, an on-site custodian. But first Fridays then, uh, and there are thousands of people down here the first Friday of, of uh, every month. And you've got you know your vintage stores, food trucks, uh, booths that are uh, just there on those weekends. You know, here they've got all their stuff outside. There's tons and tons of stores like this, just packed and packed with all your vintage things that are, it's just fun to just go look at all that stuff. And then it's the character down here, things like this, this door. And you wouldn't believe how many photographers we see down here. People who want to get their picture taken in uh, front of that door, in front of graffiti, We've seen them down here underneath the viaduct because they like the pillars. Uh, we had the, uh, what was it, the UMKC Ballet was over in the alley over across the way one day getting, all, getting their pictures taken. So uh, it's very popular uh, backgrounds and it's also because of things like this building, just the kind of character that's here and the history that's here and it attracts people. So first Fridays and then New housing on the horizon. So our first new housing was down here and uh, Bill Hall built it. It's across from the Livestock Exchange building. Um, I'm not quite sure how many units are in there and not a whole lot. He's got offices on the first floor. But any minute now, uh, latest issue is gonna be this spring. This area here will be developed into condominiums. This is where Kemper Arena uh, is now and is currently being remodeled into a uh, youth sports facility. They're putting a second floor in it and they'll be uh, doing all kinds of different uh, youth sports there, soccer, baseball, whatever they need a field for. And then uh, up here uh, off of 9th Street, uh, actually over by the, uh, uh, there's a dedication of the Confluence statue this Friday, which is uh, down there at uh, 9th Street, right at the foot of the bridge, across from uh, the urban eatery. Uh, <clears throat> an Ohio company has bought nine buildings over there. 
that they intend to turn into condominiums. So housing is coming down here. One of the big issues has been uh, parking and uh, the, their parking requirements. But uh, that, all, that stuff is all being worked out. And uh, the bottoms is uh, once we get housing down here, I mean, it'll take off. It'll be time for a big box grocery store, really, because of uh, all the apartments here in, uh, on, up on Quality Hill and uh, over in River Market. They're building more over in, uh, in Berkeley Park. Uh, they've got uh, multi-use uh, facilities up there. And uh, we're here. So no housing there, but a uh, perfect place for uh, the River Center. And then West Bottoms Reborn. West Bottoms Reborn, uh, it was a, uh, a grant that uh, from Historic West Bottoms and uh, the Kansas City Design Center, uh, City of Kansas City. Uh, the idea is to uh, increase social and civic engagement. Uh, so uh, basically integrating art and um, space into the urban planning process. Uh, you know, we have a 1% for art uh, on public buildings, but so often uh, art in an area is comes after and is added on uh, with West Bottoms Reborn it is being uh, designed into the initial planning process. And so uh, with West Bottoms Reborn, they've looked at empty spaces and uh, what they can do with them. And as part of uh, uh, Heritage Week, uh, the, well, you need to go to westbottomsreborn.com to get their full uh, schedule. But Friday, there's a bunch of stuff going on over at Caw, Caw Point. Uh, there'll be several information booths. We're going to have the big boat. We're, I think we're taking two boatfuls of people up to, up to that Turkey Creek Diversion Tunnel to show it to them. <laughs> Never go wrong with looking at a tunnel. <laughs> uh, and then they're going to, uh, in these uh, three spaces that they've, uh, they've come up with, they're going to do some uh, non-permanent structures basically making these social gathering areas uh, around all of this stuff uh, really a, a hopeful thing and uh, the idea of actually incorporating art and community spaces into the entire planning process something that we've learned over a hundred years of planning <laughs> and, and the, the hit and miss and how we've seen the city develop and how things, some work and some don't. So West Bottoms Reborn, uh, definitely uh, go to that website and check out their stuff. We've, there's a, a walking tour. Uh, there's a, uh, I think it's the Lake Laramie walking tour is Thursday evening. Lake Laramie is that puddle in the parking lot behind the ship over by where Union, the old Union Depot used to be. Uh, that's been Doug Lake, Lake Laramie, and that's, uh, that's kind of just a, a remnant uh, uh, indicativeness of the uh, West Bottoms and what the bottoms are. And uh, any bottoms, are, uh, they're basically floodplain. We're at a delta here. And, uh, you know, they're flat, they're right next to the river, they're easy to develop, but it's not a real good idea because of the floods, you know? <laughs> so you either need to take precautions ahead of time or it really works best if we can let rivers uh, act on, in their own way, manner and give them room to act. But that's never gonna happen with the Missouri River now because of uh, all the navigation we've done on it and the, uh, the channelization to it. So uh, we can't really, we, there's no way you can let that go back over there where the uh, downtown airport is, that was all uh, sandbars and marshes and braided channels. You know, Lewis and Clark said the river was two miles wide when they got here. It doesn't mean it was water all the way across. It was floodplain. It was, uh, it changed, cha the channel changed overnight, which is a, a big issue for, for pilots too. You know, they used to say that, um, uh, Mississippi River boat pilots uh, were pleasure cruisers and that real men piloted the Missouri River. <laughs> so, welcome to the River Center. <laughs> the, 
this building was built in 1933, part of the livestock industry, uh, serum lab. We were actually in a barn. Uh, you could see where the posts for the stalls were cut out, and you can see where there was the sidewalk, the passage between down in the middle of the stalls. So there were stalls there, here, there, and there. The other side over there too. This is an all concrete structure, which is a little bit different. A lot of what we saw down there was, was uh, brick, but this was up to date in 1933. And uh, so it was a serum lab for the livestock industry uh, for a long time. And uh, when that industry left, uh, so did uh, the lab eventually. Part of the uh, uh, heritage of the stockyards, uh, Kansas City has become a um, uh, veterinary medicine um, center uh, for developing uh, serums for the livestock industry, uh, for, the, for the pet trade, for uh, uh, I suppose antibiotics for chickens, you know. Uh, all of that stuff is now coming uh, basically f uh, through Kansas City, and some of it's moved out to Overland Park now. But a lot of it started right here, and it was because of the, uh, the livestock trade. So this building uh, was actually added on. The two stories there will go upstairs, and you can walk out on top onto this. We have art and science on the river here. And uh, this uh, Shawnee Mission High School students, we take them out in October. They have until the first Friday of May to come up with an uh, art project that doesn't have to be river-centered. It's just based basically on the river experience. Gives them a total, total way of looking at something. You know, I grew up here. I didn't know anything about the Missouri River. We drove across it to go to Grandma's house. You know, it wasn't until I got involved uh, in the 90s with uh, environmental education that I found out rivers were connected to each other <laughs> and where the rivers in our town went. You know, they t teach me about the, the Nile River in history, but they didn't teach me about the Blue River right here in Kansas City. So uh, it's not surprising that uh, people don't know about their rivers and don't understand uh, their connection to their rivers. Uh, but um, with the uh, art students, uh, there wasn't anything on the roof up there. And so they said, a group of them wanted to put a prairie in. I said, okay, well, maybe not a prairie. How about, what if we, we want to build a labyrinth up there? Let's do a labyrinth. Okay. Kept getting, changing and getting smaller until it was going to be a rain garden, then it was going to be a flower bed. We finally said, well, where are you going to get your material? Uh, what, what are you, how are you going to do this? How are you going to do that? Have, have you talked to anybody else about any of this? So we finally, uh, we said, you know, this is how we do it. <laughs> so uh, we got uh, landscape architect, uh, uh, engineers, um, several other people. Uh, did a design charrette. We had the students there. We t talked about uh, what was uh, what our strengths were up there, and what our basic needs were up there. Uh, the strengths is all the. As a nonprofit, we get donated all kinds of stuff. Uh, and you will see <laughs> our handrails up there are amazing. So we had uh, a lot of uh, pallets, uh, some secondhand wood, and some uh, rowing skulls. When we got here, the Kansas City Rowing Club was in this uh, building here, and they uh, used it for storing their uh, boats during the winter. And they take them out to Wyandotte County Lake during the summer. So those are those skinny little boats with, you know, uh, they had the 12-man team ones, and then they had the one man that looked like a toothpick, uh, but uh, it, it was all rowing, and uh, we used part of those for handrails. What we needed the most up there was uh, railing, and then we uh, did some uh, uh, rooftop gardening, and we've added to it every year, and uh, we're extremely pleased with it, and let's go up there. <laughs> 